So today, what we wanted to do was actually talk about how to build and use maintenance job plans. And if you don't have something like this, I strongly suggest that you, you create it. And it's really a process workflow. And this particular one, we're actually just going to look at the top portion uh, of the, the, the plan. And obviously, see, I've actually taken the animation out because of the fact that we're using uh, the web technologies and the animations are very slow to pop up. So, but typically, you know, you plan and approve, you actually don't plan, but approve and generate a work order when it's entered after, from the request. And then you might change the status and put it to waiting planning. And then the planner, when they come in in the morning or during the course of their day, if you look at the day of the life of a planner, what happens is they go out and they scan all the work orders that are waiting planning. And when they find those, they change their status to in planning. And that's a flag within the CMMS that allows us the opportunity, computerized CMMS, computerized maintenance management system, that allows us, to, that way we understand where we're at with regard to the work order itself. You know, are we waiting materials? Are we ready to schedule? Or are we in planning in this case? So we're, we're starting the workflow. The planner's now got control of the, of the work order. And we're, we're starting our initial job screening activities. And as part of that, what we're really trying to do is look and say, OK, do we have enough information to properly scope the job? And one of the things I should mention, too, right here is that the planner is the guardian of the CMMS data. And so you're putting it, when, you, when the work orders come back in, ideally, you're putting in something besides it was broke, it was fixed. You know, because we want that history to go back and mine the data later to understand from a reliability engineering standpoint, you know, why are we failing? And so it's really important that we have valid CMMS codes. Um, and also with regard to realistic timing, it's very important that we have enough time to proactively plan the schedule of work and get the materials. And uh, also with regard to authorization, and do we even need to do the work itself? That's, that's usually a very good question. Um, and you may actually, depending on your level of authority, have to go in and get approval based on the cost, specific cost. So that might determine if it needs to be done or not. And then, of course, do we already have it in the system? Is it something we're already working on? Maybe it's a, a request for a capital project improvement or something like that. So, but at the end of the day, what we're really trying to determine is what level of planning is required. And which brings us to this next question. Do all jobs require a job plan? And some of you in the poll that we just did, you said, well, you know, many cases you only had occasionally a job plan. And that may be OK. Um, you know, obviously, if you, if you never have a job plan, then there's a problem. But it depends, it depends on the level of detail. What you're trying to do is actually balance the, you know, all, all jobs can benefit from a job plan itself. But sometimes, you know, for example, if you're changing the lamp in a, in a fluorescent fixture, obviously we don't need a job plan for that. We just need to know that, you know, we need a box of, of fluorescent lamps and we might run a route, as an example, and physically go in and change those lamps. We don't need a plan for that. But, so not all, plan, not all jobs require a job plan. But for the more complex and detailed ones, we want them. And you might ask, well, why? Why is it that we want a job plan? Well, if you look at craft efficiencies itself, oftentimes what I hear from maintenance guys is I'm always looking for the information. You know, if I could just have the information to do my job right, the OEM cut sheets or, uh, for example, to I never can find the parts. And so one of the goals of the job plan is here's all the information you need to execute the work. And in addition to that, here's all the materials. Because ideally, what we want to do is have all those materials staged and kitted when the job is ready to schedule, before we ever schedule it, along with the information and other resources that we need, special tools, as an example. And then we're able to take those and give them to the technician, and the technicians can simply go out and execute the work. And when you look at the job plan as well, it serves the function of a checklist. So you have a specific task and the sequence of the task. And when we talk about having precision maintenance, as an example, 
what are the gaps, the fits, the torques, the clearances, the tolerances, uh, all the different things that bring the job to a specification. When you think about it, if you rebuild pumps frequently, as an example, there's lots of clearances and gaps and, and things that you have to work in. So we want those documented on the job plan, which provide a tech, provides that technician the information they need to execute the job to, to a precision level. And then everyone knows that we're suffering from uh, and will continue to suffer actually through 2012, excuse me, 2025, when all the baby boomers finally retire, uh, all the exodus of people leaving. I was, when I, I talked to you there earlier, I said I was uh, doing a four-part series this week, and the four-part series I asked the age of the workforce for these particular people that were in the group, and, and they said that their, their workforce was 56, was the average age. And some organizations I go to, it's closer to 60. So the knowledge is walking out of the door 30 years and beyond. And we want to be able to capture that knowledge and, and put it into the job plan so that we can use it as a training tool. And in addition to that, I find that some of the technicians have figured out better ways to do things, build a better mousetrap, and which saves time and, and saves effort and labor on the part of the technicians and frustration, not to mention that. And the nice thing is, is you can put that information into the job plan, and that becomes the standard method of work moving forward. So and in addition to that, when you think about it, much of our work is very repetitive. We tend to do the same job over and over. It may not be within the same year, but it might be. So, and I'm reminded of this, this bottling company that I worked with, and, and what they would do is they would run through the summer, and then they would shut down, you know, start shutting down pieces of equipment and overhauling them. And while that's probably the most expensive way to do your maintenance, short of, you know, run to failure, what they were doing is they would send, say, Fred out. And Fred would go look and say, okay, come back to a, a guy who bought the parts and say, okay, well, I'm going to need these parts to do the work on this filler, as an example. And, you know, they come back, you know, the next year, and they send Fred back out there, and he'd get the list together again and, and do it. And the whole point of the job plan is we can write that one time. We can capture that information, for example, like for the materials, and put that on the job plan itself. So next year, we don't have to send Fred back out there and have him go back and survey all the, the parts and pieces he needs because we already have a record of it. And the nice thing is, is we can make that better every time we send it out. So with the, goal, the goal with job plans is you want to write once, and reuse it many, many times. So you have to think of job plans almost as a, reuse, a technical library that's reusable. And so it doesn't matter whether it's actually physically on a, on a bookshelf somewhere or it's in the computer in the form of a Word document or a PDF document or you know, inside your computerized maintenance management system itself in the, in the task uh, section. So, Again, the goal is write it once, reuse it many times, and you think again about the benefits. Well, your craftspeople benefit because you know here they've got a document, and they can work down the document. And, and some guys, you know, it's just like when you when you go for surgery. You know, I'd much rather have the surgeon have a checklist and say, okay, well, yeah, you know, I need to do this, 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 and this. But in addition to that, here's the materials I need, and I want to make sure they didn't leave anything in me as an example. Uh, you know, if they had, they started off with 12 scalpels, I want to make sure they come back with 12 scalpels as a number, you know, just to, but for the planners, it also makes the planner's job easier because once you plan that job, you know, you're, you're fairly well done with it except for the continuous improvement aspects of it. And so now you don't have to go back out and rewrite it. You don't have to go research those materials. And so as a good example, I work with one group in California and they're, they have 35-year-old uh, circuit breaker systems, and they have one 30-amp circuit breaker that has been obsolete for many, many years. And they said, okay, well, you know, they searched for probably six months trying to find somebody who could remanufacture the circuit breakers, and they finally found a guy in North Carolina who could do that. Well, one of the ways to capture that information is inside the job plan. Ideally, too, you could do it in the item master uh, for your materials, you know, in the inventory management system side. But, you know, again, here's what it is. And so the, so the planners 
benefit there as well. And of course, I mentioned earlier the organization benefits because we're driving the efficiency of the craftsperson. If we look at, for example, like Jacksonville Electric Authority, what they saw is they saw their, uh, they had 30 technicians and when they put planning in and they drove their wrench time up from roughly about 30, 35% to 55%, it, they actually got the work of 47 technicians and they still never increased their headcount from above 30. And it was just because they were working smarter. So obviously the organization benefits hugely. In addition to that, the job plan, we're averaging time. So this week the crash person goes out and does the job and it takes an hour. And he goes out and does it um, six months from now and it takes him an hour and a half. And we can go back and look and say from an operations perspective, Mr. Production Manager or whatever the case may be, we're going to need access to that piece of equipment and we should be roughly about an hour to an hour and a half. And so we can establish you know, good estimates and they become repetitive over time. So there's another benefit as well. When we get into the job planning process itself, the first, the first piece, we've taken that job into planning and now it becomes the planner's responsibility to research that job. What does that really mean? Well, let's say I'm going to work on some pumps. And as a planner, what you should do is you should spend roughly one third of the day, one third of the day in the field doing job research. So you might go over to that pump and you might look at it and say, okay, well, I'm going to replace that pump and I'm going to, we rebuild them in the shop, so I'm going to take one that I have in stock and I'm going to put it over here. Well, how is it I'm going to access that pump? Well, I might need to, you know, obviously I need to take the guard off the coupling, so that would be, a, you know, first I need to do my lockout and tag out, and then I'm going to take the guard off the coupling, and, you know, then I'm going to take the coupling loose, and then I'm also going to rig, you know, I'm going to isolate the valve. I've already isolated the valves. I'm going to disconnect the flanges from the pump, uh, and then I'm going to set up my rigging, and I'm going to rig to lift that pump out of the way, and I'm going to set the new one in, and I'm going to do, so all these are steps that I'm going to capture on that job plan. So when I'm out there in the field, I go up to that pump and I start that list. I might very well make sketches or, or simple drawings and then I might take and, and put, uh, as an example, uh, I might look at the materials. So, well, I might say, you know, I might choose to replace the coupling because I look at it and the, the, the splines are worn, as an example, or whatever the case may be. So I'm looking at that information and I'm making those notes. And I might also have taken my OEM manuals out with me and actually be looking and saying, okay, well, here's some parts and pieces that I need. Yeah, I might can reuse this, and I'm going to need to replace that, and so I'm making those notes. And as part of that, too, I might very well ask the technicians who work on the equipment, how is it that you would approach the job? And so I, I might, in addition to the sketches or drawings, I might take pictures. And, you know, especially for, like, piping changes or things like that, and then I actually what happens is, as part of the job research, when I, I get back to my desk, I look at the equipment history. How often are we doing this job? Uh, is it excessively frequent, meaning that we're having a, a high rate of failure? Uh, what about from a parts costing standpoint? If we're doing it all the time, is it because certain parts aren't holding up? And maybe we need to work with our procurement group to say, how is it that we could choose different um, different materials or whatever the case may be. So and then once we get back to our desk, we've got all these notes. So we sit down and we begin to put together the job plan. And the job plan really might start off with your safety information, my lockout, my tag out, uh, what types of PPE I might need, uh, what type of permits that I might need as well. For example, maybe I need a confined space entry permit. Obviously, I can't fill it out, but I can include it, so I can make a note that this is part this is part of what I need. So that way, when I get ready to put the work package together itself, I've got all that information. So okay, well, this, this, and this, and it becomes a checklist for the planner. Then, you know, how much do I think it's going to cost? You know, and to get that, I might estimate the hours. I, I need to determine which crafts are required. Maybe I need an electrician, as an example, to disconnect the motor. Uh, so I give them 15 or 30 minutes to do that, depending on the complexity. And then I might uh, need a mechanic for four hours to, to actually physically do the work. 
or maybe on a gearbox or something like that, or a pump. And then I take, you know, I bring that uh, uh, the electrician back in after the mechanic finishes. So I need another 15 or 30 minutes, depending again on the complexity of the job. So all of that gets documented in that job plan. And in addition, we, we talked about materials. Well, what are the materials? Maybe I need a gasket. Maybe I need to seal. All those type things. And as part of the job plan preparation, typically the, the planner might look in the stockroom, you know, inventory and say, okay, what is it that I can buy from stockroom first? And you really want to, if you can get your parts from the stockroom first, do that as opposed to buying it outside of the inventory system. And the reason you want to do that is because you need to turn those items over in the stockroom. And so you might very well reserve your parts. Um, some CMMS systems, computerized maintenance management systems, have the ability to reserve parts. Some don't. But if you have that, then you can set that up, you know, I'm going to dedicate that part for this particular job. And then if you're buying parts outside of the system, what you need to do is, is create the purchase requisition or however you buy within your organization and get that over to the procurement part, department or whatever so they can purchase that for you and, and get it coming. Um, a lot of times, actually, what I like to do when I'm setting up or helping organizations become more successful with the maintenance best practices, I try to get the materials management group, if you have one, to take ownership of that. So I basically give them the job, the, the work package itself, which includes the requisition forms and things, and turn it over to them and say, okay, here, you go and procure all the materials and then set the flag to schedule ready inside this computerized maintenance management system when all the parts come back in. So those are options. And then the other thing that you want to include, for example, uh, would be the special tools. We talked about on that pump job just a little while ago, uh, what would we do with regard to rigging? But one of the things you definitely don't want to do if, if you've got guys that are, for example, like climbing on a roof, climbing up to a roof or climbing a 40-foot ladder or you know, going up scaffolding, we don't want them to get to the top of the, the scaffold, for example, and then realize that they needed a two-inch wrench. So that's the whole point of having the job plan. We can go ahead and actually reserve those parts out, I mean, excuse me, reserve those tools out, and say, okay, you know, when you get up there, you're going to need a two-inch wrench, so be sure to take it with you, you know, especially if you're traveling long distances from one side of the plant to the other from where those tools might be stored. So that's, that's another piece that's very, very important. In addition, you look at your, your housekeeping and disposal issues, what are you doing? You know, with regard to those, maybe you have some special things that you have to do. So that becomes part of the job plan as well. So you might ask, well, Jeff, how do I do this inside of my CMS software? Because you talk about building a job plan, and show me what one might look like. Well, let's look at Emate's system as well, X3. And inside the task library, what you can do is you can go inside there and create this. And this is inside the PM Center itself. So what you do is you get inside the task library and you actually create a new uh, task. And for example, what you have to really be careful of too is recognize that these tasks are being stored however you name them. So they're not attached to specific jobs, okay, in this particular case, the way we're using them. Because if you notice on the bottom of this, I created a, a PM group called Corrective Action Plans for short. And it gave me a way that I could group those into, into things that were not specific to PM tasks, which the module was written for specifically more so, but for corrective action. So it gave me a way to isolate that. But when you look at the task number itself, you want to use some type of intelligent numbering system. Maybe you name it after the asset or you name it after something else. Uh, but again, you've got to be able to go back and find it because it's not attached to anything. That job plan is sitting out there in space, along with all the other job plans that you might create. So you have to be really smart with regard and disciplined with regard to how you structure your naming of those items. But here we have a basic task description. Uh, in this case, it's a fuel line um, strainer cleaning uh, procedure. And let's flip over to the next sheet. And you'll see the details. And notice how I did this. This is looking a little bit lower. We created the detail, inside the detailed description box, we created the task and sequence. And for example, here are just some of the steps. Okay, let's perform lockout tagout on the isolation valves. 
This you might think of as just one large strainer, kind of a, an upright strainer that has a, a flange across the top, and uh, we lift that off, and then we can lift the basket out. And so, you know, we're locking out the valves, we're, we're cracking the vent valve, we're releasing the residual pressure, and we're testing the lockout. And then here we actually specify the one inch wrenches, we move the flange top from the strainer. We work through all those sequences of tasks, and, you know, it can be as long as you want. And then, of course, here we actually list the uh, one mechanic and one helper, uh, four hours each. The job duration itself would be four hours. And then the materials, what specific materials here. And it's not just the parts that we might need to get from the stock room, but it's also what we'd like for the mechanics and the helper to take with them. Two cans of solvent, 55-gallon trash bags, and shop towels. And it may be that the way they do this is they, they pop that top off and they lift that basket and set it in the trash bags and then they scrape and clean the outside and inside of the basket. Uh, and so we're telling them how to do it. And then and the tools required, you know, a one-inch socket and a socket wrench and a, a one-inch open-end wrench. Now they might need a ladder. They might need other things. And again, so we can tell them specifically what it is they need to take. One of the things that I like to do on job plans that I write is provide a, re a revision history because recognize that we want to continuously improve this plan over time. So, you know, here I say on, on 2211 we added one inch wrenches. So, now recognize that the job plan itself exists in the technical library. It's not attached to anything. Uh, and we can also open that plan back up and so if you've got one for a particular type centrifugal pump, as an example, and we have to work on another type, another brand centrifugal pump, but it's very similar, we can actually copy that original um, job plan that we had, copy parts and pieces of it, and reuse it on this other one over here. So again, I'm making the work less and less. And what you may find, too, is that you actually put in, uh, for example, you might have one specific to safety. Uh, procedures. You know, in your organization you may have JSAs, uh, job safety uh, stuff. And so based on that, you could, uh, you know, encapsulate some of those. Those may live in a different system as well. But again, it depends on your organization. But the goal is, is you can take parts and pieces of those job plans and reuse them in many places. So let's look at the work order and the email. Here's one that I created. And basically, if you look down uh, toward the bottom where you have brief description, it says operation notes, operations notes that the strainer is clogging up. So we know what the issue is. It's, it's clogging up, so we're reducing flow. So we need to fix that. Well, what we do is inside the work order itself, we go down to work procedures, and we add this job plan into those procedures. So all we have to do is, is go add, select the, uh, look in the task listing of files that we've already created, and insert this right into the work order. We didn't have to cut and paste or anything like that. It was simply just picking that file name and popping it in. Now, let me mention here, too, that what happens is you can um, also do the link to external documents as well. So um, when we talk, there are other approaches, and I'll get into the external documents in just a second, but when you think about creating a, uh, you could create a PM itself. Uh, and then the job plan could become, you know, still out there by itself, be pulled into that PM. And in addition, you could you could also insert the uh, the materials and other things. And then when it came time to specifically do that job, you could manually uh, generate the PM itself, which would again give you the information you needed. Another thing that other companies do, where their CMS isn't working as well. What they do is they take it on a shared drive somewhere uh, on a file server, Novell or whatever you might have. It uh, they create a directory structure, and you have to be careful of that directory structure because remember you have to go back and find these things later. So maybe you set it up for areas of the plant or you know different buildings or whatever the case might be. But there you can store word documents or uh, pictures, uh, PDF files, OEM manuals. Uh, you could even get, you know, have movies of basically the, the certain portions of a repair procedure, maybe setting a clearance or a gap or, or certain things. Uh, you could have that, and then you could link that back into the work order itself. And when you went and uh, 
printed out the work order, you could print out this other material and give them basically that job package. But again, this is all dependent on your computerized maintenance management system itself and its capabilities. So that all said, we've created you know, these job plans and we've shown you how to do that inside eMain. Let's talk about what you need to schedule the work. When we think about if we've got 30 or 40 job plans to do in a week, obviously we can't get to that level of detail. That's an issue unto itself. So how do we do this? Well, we really want to get the basic three things, a minimal job plan out. And what that is is the crafts required, the estimated hours, and whatever materials are necessary. You notice there's no tasks, steps, there's no tools, nothing like that. But what we do is we get all 30 or 40 of them planned with this minimum level. And then what we do is we take and we go back, once we get this done in, in the course of the week, we go back and we put together two or three of the more critical jobs. We plan those in much greater detail. And so that way we're still driving the efficiency of the craftspeople. Now that said, what we do after that, that only really works, minimal job plan only really works if you have a feedback loop. So let's talk about that. The, the planner scheduler develops the job plan and then we send it out and it might be that minimal plan. It should be in the case for all job plans though we have a continuous feedback loop. So here's the way it works. You, the, plan, the planner sends it out, technician goes and executes the job and then as part of the process that technician's looking at it saying okay well I could do this differently or I could do whatever and this is the specific task steps I used or Mr. Planner, you forgot to give me this part, whatever the case may be, and they feed that information back to the planner. So what happens is, is really you want the technicians to provide that information back, and sometimes it's good to use a work order feedback form to facilitate those activities. But as part of that, you know, they send that information back to you as the planner, and you have the responsibility to update, to update the job plan. And then the next time it goes back out, it's been improved over the last time you sent it out. Every time it goes out, you should be trying to continuously improve it. So it comes back to this question, Jeff, are there, is there such a thing as a perfect job plan? And the answer is no, there's not. So th there's good job plans, but I've never seen a perfect one that, couldn't, that didn't have an opportunity for some level of improvement. And that's the point. So that's the continuous feedback loop that you want to rely on to improve the plans themselves. Let's look at the work order feedback form itself. Now, when you send a job plan out, you might choose to send something like this. And the goal with it is we want to be able to explain to the technicians what it is that we're actually trying to accomplish. I have one organization I work with. For some reason, they just forgot about the job plan. We were talking about that earlier. And the technicians were coming back in and they were entering their data in the computerized maintenance management system. And then the organization said, well, we want you to use these feedback forms too. And they, didn't, they never sent the job plan itself. So they went out and did the, uh, they sent the feedback form. The technicians were saying, okay, well, why do I have to fill out this feedback form? And I'm having the end of the data in the computerized, in the computer anyway. What's the point? And, but the whole goal with this is, is you may not send this out on everything, but we're trying to, again, we're trying to get feedback on the job itself with regard to the plan. So if we look here, did the job plan include the proper PPE, lockout, tagout, task sequence, uh, crafts, hours, parts, materials, all those things? How can we improve it? And it's an opportunity for the technician to provide that information back to the planner. And down at the bottom, did anything go wrong? If so, can we correct it? Did we finish the job? And if there were any delays, what was the reason for the delay? and it's an opportunity for the technician to highlight that. And do we need to follow up with anything? Do we generate a separate work order if we did? If not, then as the planner, you should look for that and add that to it. So did you clean up, did, did you do the housekeeping behind you, you know, clean up the job site? Did you test run? Uh, did you notify that your, your operations partners that you were done with the job? And of course, always the thing that some organizations struggle with is returning spares back to the storeroom, the unused parts. And with regard to that, do you need to change the bill of materials associated with that particular asset? Maybe the parts are no longer correct or may have never been correct for that particular asset. 
and is there anything differently we need to do with regards to preventive or predictive maintenance procedures? And of course, there's notation for signing that.